Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Bosch just told me to come up with an alternate prospective diagnosis and put in the WOP, and I did it. The second story, HR worked according to company policy, so I used it for my own purposes. The third story, used the company's health and safety rules against them to make them spend $7,000 fixing a ramp they really didn't want to fix. Today's first story is, you want me to write a fiction? Fine, but I'm making it a good one. I'm a machinery operator in an industrial setting. This means we have a lot of trade professionals on site 24-7 to minimize the impact of any breakdowns. On this particular occasion, I had a heated press shut down on me because it was reporting a temperature of around 3600 degrees Celsius. The required temperature range is about 275. Since I have multiple stations on this machine, and it's designed with failures in mind, I'm able to just run with that one station disabled, with negligible loss in production. So I put in a mid-priority work order and pretty much forgot about it. Now, I'm not a ticketed professional myself, but since this is half the temperature of the surface of the sun, and I didn't appear to have been immolated alive, I put the problem down as a malfunctioning sensor. A few hours later in the shift, an electrician stopped by to get more details. I'm a bit of a curious person, so in the interim I had looked up the melting point of steel, which is what the actual contact surface of my press is. Depending on specifics, it's around 1500. The boiling point is around 2900. I expected this information to be for personal amusement only. I was wrong. I described the problem to the electrician and showed him my reading, alongside all the other stations which were normal. Obviously, I informed him that a reading in the 3000s was not possible, but he disagreed and told me, maybe that's the temperature. Fair enough, I'd had to look it up myself, so I'm not going to fault him for not immediately realizing this reading was nonsensical. I told him that steel boils at less than the reading I gave him, but he wasn't having it, and insisted that I put in a WOP, work order parallel for the engineers. Officially, this just means the diagnosis was not immediately clear to the operator, and creates a second tag with an alternate explanation so that when one tradesman closes the tag, the alternates are closed automatically. Unofficially, it would act as a black mark on my records, essentially telling the entire maintenance crew that I don't know my machines, and don't know what I'm doing, and would result in more people questioning my judgments in the future. I don't have a lot of those, so I was already pretty annoyed that he was trying to push me around over this, but I can see where from his point of view it would seem reasonable to assume that a random person, just happening to know the state change temperature for metals, is hard to believe so I was still resolved to remain reasonable. I went to the supervisor instead and told him the situation, expecting him to just tell the electrician I'm in the right and to go have a look at the sensor during our next breakdown or scheduled halt. Instead, he just told me to come up with an alternate prospective diagnosis and put in the WOP. Notably, he didn't actually specify engineer as the electrician had. I should note here too that the supervisor in question is an experienced welder, meaning he should know full well how ludicrous the demand was. Well, QMC. Since this wasn't an urgent issue at any rate, I decided to take my time with the new work order. I reached out to manager to get the procedures for a work order that requires out-of-house services and government agencies. Waiting for those details meant I would be taking this home and finishing it up on my own time, but at this point I was invested. I actually went through drafts on this thing, but the finished product was a masterpiece of BS. Since 3600 degrees would have sublimated my entire machine, I worked under the assumption that my lungs had been coated with various aerosolized metals that were blocking whatever little function my lungs could possibly retain after being exposed to apocalyptic temperatures. I explained that all the events since encountering the reading must therefore be hallucinations brought on by my failing brain as I succumbed to certain death. I made a point to detail how grateful I was that the delusion had apparently isolated me from the mind-melting agony my body must be in. I summarized my last will and testament in the vague hope that in my dying utterances it might actually be communicated to somebody still alive in reality. I recommended immediate contact with Environment Canada for disaster cleanup. I requested a specific funeral home, but specified that I did not wish to be cremated. I also made a point to mention by name the two people who had graciously informed me that my equipment could be expected to function normally in the temperature range of a sunspot. These work orders are the size of a postcard, and the actual request part is typically 4-15 to 15 words. I handed this sucker in with three sheets of full scap stapled to it. If it had actually been processed, it would have created a mountain of paperwork, since I can't imagine Environment Canada reacting well to receiving a major disaster notification, followed by actually sorry never mind, 
one of our employees is being a butt. Predictably, I was hauled in to speak with management before noon that day to explain myself. I did receive a write-up, which I refused to sign, and demanded a union rep on hand since I had no way to follow my orders without being ridiculous. They declined to bring one in, so that should be the end of that. The faulty sensor had been replaced by the time I got back to my machine. Update. Essentially, the software receiving no feedback from the sensor and assuming it was infinity degrees. While this was the case, there's more to it. A faulty controller had allowed the heating element to receive 100% power supply, despite reporting that it was delivering zero. It cooked the sensor and caused the open circuit reading. We burned out another sensor to figure that out, but after having now replaced both the sensor and the controller, it's working correctly again. The next story is... HR tries to gaslight me and screw me. They end up bending over backwards. I work for a multinational consulting company. I just recently finished my engineering degree, and since I was already working there as an intern, when they offered me a full-time job, I figured I'd accept it while I looked for another job that I would enjoy more. The project I was in was a complete SH show. The client was always angry at us because we were late on our deliveries constantly. The PL was a good guy but didn't have a clue about what us pawns were doing on a daily basis, and would chew everyone out whenever things didn't go as he planned, and the project itself was boring as hell, so there really wasn't any challenge or opportunity for learning anything valuable. To top it off, while most of my coworkers were cool guys, some of them were just slackers that tried to do the absolute minimum, and oftentimes not even that, which usually meant more work for me. There was a huge amount of turnover too, so high that I was one of the vets despite having been there for only six months. So the project never really felt to be getting any traction. To be fair though, they always treated me well and with respect, so nothing to complain on a personal level. After two months with my new contract and that sucky project, I finally found a job at another company that I really liked. Salary and other benefits were far better than what I had at the moment, and the project was much more interesting. I passed all the interviews with flying colors, and they offered me the job, starting the following month. Great. In my country, you usually need to give a 15-day notice before leaving your current job, or you risk facing penalties. Now it was my first time switching jobs, so I called HR to confirm this and they did. It's also relevant that once you put in your leave notice, the company can actually let you go, whenever they want, before the 15 days are over. This meant that if I would have told them right then that I was leaving next month, they easily could have let me go the next day, and I would have been left without a job for the entire month. With all this information, I decided to wait a couple of weeks before putting in my leave notice, about 17 days before the starting date at my new job, so I could at least guarantee myself half a month's salary. The day comes in and I talk to HR to put in my notice. They're very polite, trying to convince me to stay, but give up when I tell them what my new conditions will be. Then the conversation goes as follows. HR, all right then, we'll process your leave request. Your last day being 1st of October, you'll be deducted 6 days of salary. Me. Wait, what? Why? HR. Oh, you need to give us notice 15 labor days before leaving. It's company policy. Me. But I literally talked to you a couple of weeks ago, and you never specified that they had to be labor days. We always talked about natural days. HR. I doubt that. It's always been labor days, not natural days. This exchange goes on for a bit, and I start having the feeling that he's gaslighting me so I try to think of another solution. Me, I still have six vacation days left over. Can I just take those right after I leave? HR, no, sorry, can't do, company policy. So here I am thinking these duplicitous, gaslighting, unhelpful Tobies at HR have got me by the balls. The only thing he does is remind me that company policy is set in stone. Finally, I tell them that I would look into my options and call back. I start going through my contract to see if I could do anything about this, and I gotta say, I struck gold. The contract I signed was a regular indefinite time contract. However, the first three months of it were probatory, which meant that the company could terminate it at any time, without repercussions for any reason. I looked it up on Google and I confirmed my suspicions. The same was true for the employee. It had been only two months since I signed, so I could leave whenever I wanted. No notice needed at all. With the biggest SH eating grin I could muster, I call HR back. Me. Hey, it's me, OP, calling you back about my leave notice. I just read my contract, and since I'm still on probatory period, I take it I can leave whenever I want, no penalties whatsoever. Like for instance right now, at 12.39 in the afternoon, is that correct? Silence for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 seconds. HR, I guess we can probably arrange it for you to leave right before the 1st of October if you wish. No SH. The last story is, won't fix the ramp, but give me the ability to close it? Okay then. A few years ago, I ended up working at a remote work site. The crew I worked with had multiple jobs. 
one of which was unloading the truck that came in once a week with all the site's food. The unloading area was at the back of the kitchen and hadn't been designed well originally. It was an uneven gravel ramp that led up to a roughly four foot loading dock. In an ideal world, the truck would be able to back up to the loading dock and the job would be reasonably easy. However, the ramp also wasn't very wide. There was a dog leg in the run up to it and also the truck would be at an angle. So moving the pallets of food would be tough. So the workaround was to have a forklift take the food from the truck, drive up the gravel ramp and drop the food on the dock. When I first got there, we had a forklift operator who had worked with a forklift for years. He was good, like really good. He made it seem easy. This wasn't my first job working around forklifts and I really appreciated how good this guy was. I'm not sure many others, especially management, realized that he made this short but tricky run in the forklift look way easier than it actually was. He left and management scrambled to get another guy licensed to drive the forklift. This guy didn't have the experience and he struggled. He lost a load off his forks at one point and it was kind of scary. He was a yes man and there wasn't many other options, so he persevered. A lot of us were worried it was just a matter of time before he tipped the forklift over the edge of the ramp. The solution would have been to redesign the ramp or at least pave it. The gravel was a large part of the problem. It was a little thick, so the tires would spin, a bit off kilter, and it would develop potholes. The forklift needed to get a run up to carry speed up this ramp. That's how bad it was. We complained, but the company didn't want to do anything because they were building a new kitchen on the other side of the camp. So this one was going to be decommissioned. However, there had been zero work done on the new kitchen in the three to four months I'd been there. This remote site was in Australia, and they have some pretty strict health and safety laws there. Companies will often have you fill out cards every day of what we saw that was maybe dangerous. I filled out one for this ramp every single week we had to use it, but they didn't do anything. The system was really there to cover themselves, i.e. you knew it was dangerous, it says here on the card, so why did you keep doing the thing, while also expecting us to keep doing the thing. However, one of the other rules pretty much gave the right for any employer to tag out something that isn't safe. The company can't overrule this, as if they do then something happens, it's on them. These tags are normally used with machinery, i.e. the machine is broken, can't be used until it's fixed. The tag out system is not really designed for an area. Cue malicious compliance. The ramp is broken slash dangerous. I decide I'm going to tag it out. I collected some cones and ropes and tagged it out. Went straight into the office to tell management what I did. Their faces are priceless. They had a week to come up with a solution as I did this immediately after we'd unloaded the weekly food drop. At first they told us that from now on we'd have to walk the boxes of food up to the storage areas. This was obviously an attempt to turn the other crew members on me. However, the cooks stopped that idea dead. The weather was hot. The majority of the food was chilled or frozen. We were only so many. There would have been a lot of food waste. So after a day or so, they got to work putting in a paved path for the forklift. It was the bare minimum they would do because they were building a new kitchen, but apparently it cost them $7,000 and pulled guys away from other duties to do it. Needless to say, I was not a popular person and I heard that some of management wanted to fire me, but there wasn't anything they could do. I left two months later anyway. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.